In the beginning, the ending was beautiful. Early spring everywhere, the trees furred pink and white. Lawns the sharp green that meant new. The sky so blue, it looked manufactured. Robins. We'd heard the cherry blossoms wouldn't blossom this year, but what was one epic blooming when even the desert was an explosion of verbena? When bobcats slinked through primroses, when coyotes slept deep in orange poppies. <coughs> one New Year's Day, we woke to daffodils, wisteria, onion grass wafting through the open windows. Near the end, we were eyeletted, we were cottoned, we were sundressed and barefoot. At least it's starting gentle, we said. An absurd comfort, we knew, a placebo. But we were built like that, built to say at least, built to reach for the heat of skin on skin, even when we were already hot. Built to love the purpling desert in the twilight, built to marvel over the pink bursting dogwoods, to hold tight to every pleasure, even as we rocked together toward the graying. Even as we held each other, warmth to warmth, and said, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, while petals sifted softly to the ground all around us. There is no such thing as the future. There are instead a near infinity of potential futures. The road as yet untraveled stretches before us in abundant directions. We get to choose the route. There is no fate but what we make. Now, of course, some of those routes are more dangerous than others. Some futures are better than others. On many of these horizons, digital dystopias loom large. Our chosen future may, for example, feature facial recognition, a technology which today is being used by police to surveil citizens despite a false positive rate above 90%, a technology touted as a way to detect sexual orientation or even to identify potential criminal, criminals or terrorists before they strike. So maybe our chosen future will, with facial recognition technology, offer up some macabre and dangerous digital resurrection of phrenology, where our appearance alone is evidence of criminality or some other aberrance, where every camera is a tool of total surveillance, building a hypermap of our movements, of our friendships, of our emotions. Or perhaps our chosen future, chosen future will be shaped by autonomous weapons. There are international efforts to ban these, but progress is patchy, Exactly the countries you'd expect are dragging their heels over this. So there's a good chance we'll face a future in which auto auto autonomous weapons, we believe them to be abhorrent and unacceptable, right up to the point at which our enemies deploy them, and then we find a new arms race begins. Or maybe, as in the design fiction Slaughterbots, a rogue group will use cheap autonomous drones to terrorize society. The good news is that these particular dystopias are elected. There's nothing inevitable about these dark futures. We can restrict, we can regulate, we can abandon these trajectories. The bad news is that there is one dystopia that stretches across all possible futures, and that, of course, is climate change. Thanks to the lag between emissions and impacts, and the awful physics of our immense atmosphere, it's certain that things will get worse for decades before they get better. The punishment is in the post. The only question now is how bad things will get. For years, climate scientists have rather had to tiptoe around the topic. They've couched their language. They've been wary of being labeled alarmists. Well, we're now realizing at last that alarmism is fully justified. The opening sentence of David Wallace Wells' book, The Uninhabitable Earth, opens with a punch to the gut. It is worse, much worse, than you think. Our climate trajectory is going to be decided within the next couple of decades. We at least get to choose our own apocalypse. Compared to global pre-industrial temperatures, 
maybe we'll end up with just one and a half degrees Celsius of warming. This is a figure that we all know. It's the intended limit of the, of the Paris Accord. But even this figure will see 5 million square kilometers of permafrost melted by 2300. It will see half of the world's population facing severe heat waves every 20 years. It will leave 130 million people exposed to severe drought. And it will create, by some estimates, an 8% drop in global, global GDP per capita. Now, this 1.5 degree target, unfortunately, is almost certainly lost. We're at around 1.1 already. The US, as we know, has withdrawn from Paris. Brazil is threatening to follow suit. And those who remain uh, signed up are falling far short of their pledges. So maybe we'll end up with three degrees. At three degrees of warming, we can expect extended droughts, crop failures, and significant geopolitical breakdown. The promise of the eternal growth age was one of positive sum benefit for everyone. Some profit more than others, sure, but generally the curve only goes up. It seems impossible that this mentality will survive the huge productivity and output losses that happen at three degrees of warming. So the implication then is clear. In place of these at least theoretical positive sum systems, we'll revert to zero sum systems. Isolation, nationalism, resource wars. If you win, I lose. The UN World Meteorological Org, they say three degrees is probably where we end up if countries immediately stick to their Paris pledges. A senior anonymous member of the IPCC sees three degrees as a likely minimum. A five-degree future is almost unimaginable. Facing temperatures last seen 55 million years ago, major global cities, Osaka, Shanghai, Miami, Jakarta, virtually wiped out. Much of Middle East and Asia uninhabitable. The Hajj pilgrimage, for example, would become a physical impossibility. Large areas of mainland Europe would be turned into desert. Canada and Siberia would become among the planet's last fertile lands. The recent Syrian crisis expelled some five million refugees, and their arrival into Europe pushed the continent into the hands of the far right. At five degrees of warming, we can expect around 20 times that number of climate refugees. Put simply, at five degrees of warming, human society devolves into a naked fight for survival. And sadly, five degrees may be where we're headed without urgent reduction in emissions. This time, we are the asteroid. Now, in recent years, I've become known as a vocal person in the field of technology ethics. I have no doubt at all in saying that climate is the moral issue of our generation and probably our century. Now, I'm not saying that other tech ethics issues, things like algorithmic bias or addiction or privacy, I'm not saying these things are unimportant. They deserve our attention, but I feel some of these concerns are rather like worrying about cholesterol while we're clutching a stab wound. If we fail on climate, human suffering will become the dominant theme of the coming decades. Because climate will exacerbate all the injustices of our world. Racism, oppression, poverty, war. It will become a Damoclean backdrop to all future generations. Since World War II, we've had this great acceleration, this huge increase in standards of living across most of the world, almost all predicated upon burning fossil fuels. This is an addictive lifestyle. It will be extremely hard to give up. We will hold tight to every pleasure, even as we rock together toward the grain. But whether you believe modern society as we know it now, whether you think it's a force for good or not, is frankly immaterial. It cannot and will not last. It cannot and will not last. Now, in an abstract, existential way, I think anyone who's paying some attention knows this. But when you really assess what it means, the personal living experience of this upheaval, it's an agonizing realization. Boy, does that abyss stare back. This change requires nothing less than mourning. We have to grieve for this familiar way of life. We have to go through those familiar steps, 
denial, anger, bargaining, depression, before we get to acceptance. Hopefully we do that quickly, while there's still time to create something better on the other side. But I think this gnawing loss is, is even more difficult for people like us, for designers, because, of course, we've been, we've been entirely complicit. We're partly responsible for this coming crisis. In 1971, Victor Papenek savaged designers for their contributions to environmental degradation. There are professions more harmful than industrial design, he said, but only a very few of them. It's tempting to think that that doesn't apply to people like us, to the world of digital work. After all, we deal in abstractions of pixels and information. We're not the people creating landfill and pollution. But I don't think that distinction holds. We don't get to wriggle off that hook of responsibility. Just ask the software engineer who cheated Volkswagen's emissions test, or the airline scrum team using dark patterns to sell more unnecessary flights. We live in a hybridized era where products and experiences are increasingly digital and physical. And of course, the technologies we build, most of them run on electricity, often from dirty sources. The greenhouse gas emissions of data centers uh, are now equivalent to those of the entire aviation industry. So we have to examine our approaches and the values that we hold dear. Our thirst for exemplary user experience, for example, has created upgrade cycles that are among the most aggressive in all of consumer goods. People buy a new phone every couple of years in pursuit of the latest hot app. They buy IoT devices with unreplaceable batteries, with obsolescence built in as a design principle. Indeed, perhaps the very idea of user-centered design is part of the problem. We trained ourselves to focus with laser-like precision on the needs of the user helping the user achieve their goal. Now, sadly, that goal a lot of the time is to buy more, consume more, emit more, everything more, more, more. And that precision has blinded us. For years, we've overlooked the unintended consequences of our work, the harms that might fall on people who are not users, that might fall on neighborhoods, communities, ecologies. User experience is a dream come true for an individual, but a potential nightmare for society. Now, we should, of course, start to address these issues, but unfortunately, I see our industry going in completely the other direction. The main trends that I see in digital design today center on effectiveness. Design ops, design systems, they're about making the modern team more scalable, more efficient, or in other words, making the modern team more compliant and acquiescent to business as usual the exact same scorched earth growth hacking business as usual that's dragging us to the five degree catastrophe. Even the tech ethics movement has fallen into habits of focusing on trivial and surface level stuff. This has been critiqued brilliantly by uh, Os Keys, Javan Hudson and Meredith Durbin, their three scholars at the University of Washington. And they proposed a paper for Kai. If you don't know Kai, it's a very significant academic HCI conference. And in this paper, they talk about a hypothetical algorithm that decides which senior citizens are selected to be mulched into high nutrient slurry and fed to the living. And the authors analyzed this problematic algorithm, and they suggested changes to reduce its inherent biases, just as the literature on algorithmic ethics suggests. And just with these simple ethical tweaks, we now have, according to the authors, a way that we can be sure that elderly people are now selected for being processed into high nutrient slurry and fed to the living in a far more fair, accountable, and transparent manner. We are squandering our global responsibilities on minutiae, on trivia. We're stoking the engines more efficiently as the ship is going down. So where would our time actually be well spent? What can we do to tackle this crisis at the proper level? Well, the climate crisis, it requires interventions from every aspect of society. It needs protesters, it needs organizers, regulators, voters, scientists. But there are plenty of personal tactics that we can deploy as well. Here are some. But I'm not going to go into these. This isn't really the right forum to do so. 
maybe take a photo if you're interested and reflect yourself, there will soon be more information at the URL at the bottom. But I do have a couple of comments on this list before we move on. Here we have a mix of changes that are individual, personal changes, and changes or suggestions that are intended to create some kind of system-level response. And we'll come back to that dichotomy shortly. But suffice to say, one danger of the modern world and its atomized nature is that it tends to individualize problems. It tends to privatize this guilt for us to bear alone. Individual action on its own won't really achieve much. But if you personally feel driven to change your own habits, and I think many of us perhaps should, then these may well be good starting points. There are also useful professional tactics, of course. Pardon me. But again, maybe a surprise, I don't really want to go into these too much either. I don't want to provide just a checklist for how we can try to tackle this problem. I want to try and do something else here. I want to talk about a new role for design amid the chaos. How designers can lift our eyes to the horizon and inspire change that's more fundamental than this. Because I think we do have plenty that we can offer. The technology industry holds an enormous amount of power, more than perhaps any other group we get to depict and to realize what happens next in our world. Now, you could argue that that power is hardly warranted, and it's also been bestowed upon us with far too little oversight. And that's true, and that, frankly, should scare us a little bit. But I think also it means that the onus, or even the moral obligation, is on us to wield that power positively to try to build better worlds. I think designers in the tech industry also have remarkable power. Now, that might be hard to see, I think, from the inside. You know, we get browbeaten by imposter syndrome, by KPIs. We get smothered by the juggernaut of product management or the process orthodoxies of agile and lean startup. But I think none of that really matters. The superpower that designers have, the talent that equips us to make meaningful contributions on tackling the world's biggest problems, is we make futures visible. Society struggles to think intelligently about the future, I think, because it's a, it's a thought experiment. We're asking people to imagine what might happen next and then to make decisions based on that hallucination. Design can make this more real. We can paint a picture of what various futures might actually look like. We can do that by making products, of course, but we can also create speculative objects that invite discussion and inspire change. We can prototype a world yet to come. In the emerging field of speculative design, these artifacts are sometimes called design fictions. Sometimes they are designed objects themselves. This is um, the transparent charging station by a Dutch firm called The Incredible Machine. And I've seen this. It's a, it's a great big whacking prototype trying to explore what charging infrastructure for electric vehicles might look like in a decade or two. And what's interesting about this is they've actually, the designers have used this design fiction to ask deep moral questions as well. How do we avoid the potential inequalities that might result from a system like this? They prototype the RFID cards that you might use to authenticate with the system. And they come with different social statuses, right? A doctor, for instance, has potentially priority within this system, whereas a recent offender might find that their energy use is capped. So we can create these objects to invite that discussion, to preempt it, if you like. Or sometimes we need to tell a design fiction as part of a wider and larger story, in which case designers can pair with writers and filmmakers, comic strip artists, anyone really who can build hypothetical worlds in which these designed objects feel at home. This is a film called Frames, um, directed by Farhad Pakdel and written by Madeleine Ashby. And I think it's a remarkable piece of design fiction. This unnamed woman essentially pushing against the seams of total surveillance using mysterious generosity. Works like Frames, for me, help to make the future feel more real. The hidden becomes more visible. So they help people experience and to feel 
what would otherwise be these hypothetical situations. And that means it's easier for people to understand what might happen next. We might say it improves people's temporal literacy, their ability to read and to understand potential futures. But why is this so important? Well, for me, it's because people can then have a fairer say. The future comes to the people. It's no longer the domain of professionals and nerds like ourselves. The public gets to approve of or to push back against any particular future. So we're talking about experiences here, designing experiences, and so this should make us happy. This is something within this room that we're pretty good at. But today's practices, for me, I see that they are near-term and generally supportive of these Silicon Valley ideals of bringing products to markets for users to consume. This new role for design is a bit different. It's speculative. It's not just focused on delivery. It's critical. It's not just play, playing along with the dominant ideologies. It's focused on the well-being of society and of the planet, not just the success of the user. Now, designers will always have to be involved in giving birth to new technologies. We don't stop doing the stuff on the left-hand side here. Hopefully, those technologies become more sustainable and more just technologies. But I think it's crucial that we start to balance those delivery mindsets with new modes of design, speculative design, critical design, long-term futures thinking. Because our futures, particularly those that are influenced by climate, are full of maybes and perhapses. They really invite that kind of speculative approach. Now, some of these futures, some of these fictions that we tell will, of course, be dystopian. We saw slaughterbots at, uh, at the beginning here, that dystopia of autonomous weapons. This is mitigation of shock by uh, a London speculative design studio called Superflux. And they prototyped essentially a London flat from 2050, uh, built to cope with the uh, awful impacts of climate change. It's a kitchen sink dystopia of desperate attempts to cultivate food, complete with a recipe for Fox Creole. Now, these sorts of dystopias, they have value. I think this is a fine piece of work. Things like this can alert people to the dangers, to the risks ahead, and they can challenge some of the decisions that we take today, decisions that look innocuous, but then when taken to some uh, harmful extreme, soon become anything but. So dystopias can create this appetite for evasive action, I suppose. But dystopias are also somewhat limited. They can motivate change, but they can also paralyze and ostracize. They can cause inaction. They can cause us to believe there's nothing left that we can do. And that kind of fatalism, I think, is particularly dangerous when it comes to climate. It will cause us to withdraw from the problem, to focus on coping rather than fixing. I think it's the realm of the so-called eco-fascist movement, whose solution to climate is to close the borders and instill martial law. Or the billionaire preppers who are busy planning their escape to cabin in the woods or to Mars. Whichever one it is, there's lots of guns involved in that scenario. So I think these cautionary tales, these terrifying fables, they, they have some value to help break, break down our comfortable, cozy narratives. But we desperately need new stories that depict a better world to come, positive visions that inspire us. I'm not necessarily talking here about utopias. We have plenty of meaningless utopias already. Something like this Microsoft Vision video that's just a mere extension of where we are right now. There's no message here except that the status quo will accelerate. Work and productivity and capitalism will be flung onto any available surface. And of course, there are dangerous utopias as well. Political extremism has often come from utopia, the idea perhaps of a purity of bloodline or the infallibility of the state or of the church. I think what we need instead are meaningful, realistic, imperfect, but compelling visions. Visions that make us dream, that we want to help navigate toward. Visions like solar punk. Solar punk is part a literary movement, it's part a collaborative work of design fiction, it's part a protest group, it's part fan fiction. All trying to answer the question, what does sustainable civilization look like? And how do we get there? 
Solarpunk focuses on what they call infrastructure as a form of resistance. These are societies built with resilience for whatever the futures ahead of us throw at us, with independence rather than isolation, with community ingenuity, not this top-down messianic control. And I think as a result, they're more compelling than other punk suffixed movements that we see around. This is optimistic, compare it to cyberpunk with its deeply nihilistic attitude. This is futuristic, compare it to steampunk and its regressive nostalgia. And that, for me, is the power of these positive visions. A dystopia gives people something to run away from. Better futures give people something to run toward. Now, with climate, we already know the solutions. We know what we have to do. We've got to cut emissions vastly, perhaps 50% in the next decade, and then down to zero within maybe 20 more than that. What we lack is the urgency and the will to make that change happen. But we can help to create this urgency and this desire for action by changing that narrative, this fatalist narrative, twisting it around and offering some hope on the other side. That morning that I talked about is vital, but we also need hope on the other side to drag people through it and on to make positive change. Now, hope is a political cliche, and it's also a climate cliche. If you read any climate literature, there always has to be a section, an uplift at the end, to say, we still have some time to change this. Some people disagree. Some people say that, actually, uh, the hope is already gone. But I refuse to believe that. Hope, for me, is a way to cling to our humanity, to inoculate ourselves against fatalism. The intention, the hope behind hope, if you like, is, of course, that it drives some change. But what sort of change do we really want? Do we want to prioritize change within individuals or change within the overarching system? And this is almost a holy war in any kind of complex system or any um, community like the climate community or the ethics community. And it's also rather politicized. The right tends to lean very much on individual responsibility, taking ownership of your own actions. The left tends to believe that systems sort of overwhelm all that stuff. So really, we need to focus there. But surely, the only meaningful response is to do both. When you see the iceberg right ahead, carving off from a doomed glacier, you throw every engine into reverse. In truth, I actually think that's a false dichotomy. They both affect each other. The systems at play on the right here, are economic and political. They're hard to sort of directly attack. They really only change with external pressure from voters, from consumers, from donors. Fortunately, with climate, there is now some evidence that building this kind of pressure and support is easier than we once feared. For example, friends and family play a huge role in shaping individual beliefs. This astonishing uh, a study was published just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and the conclusion of this paper was essentially that differences in beliefs and attitudes around climate um, are much smaller if people have close friends and family who care about the topic. The researchers call this high social consensus. So this is the green bars on the right. These are the individuals who had people around them who cared about climate change. And even the simplest belief, you know, is global warming actually a phenomenon? Um, there's a huge increase in agreement or support for that hypothesis, even among self-described conservatives in the US who've typically been very resistant to these ideas. Huge increase just if close friends and family express an interest in the topic. And we find this effect across the most important questions on climate, that it's caused by humans, that we should worry about the topic, and that we should regulate carbon dioxide, for example, as a pollutant. Now, these are remarkable findings, and I think they're promising findings for people like us who are wrestling with these wicked problems. This suggests that concern and that hope are contagious, that even the most ardent opponents can be challenged and their views can be changed. I think we should feel emboldened by research like this. Most importantly, for me, the study suggests that the real picture is something a bit more like this. 
individual change snowballs into collective change. And collective change has a real chance of permeating these structures, these systems that have otherwise been impenetrable, these economic and political systems. Just this morning, the UK government announced that we're going to aim for net zero emissions by 2050. This is great news. But I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have done that without the recent Extinction Rebellion protests which have helped to permeate this collective consciousness. So this gives me at least some renewed hope that we can make systemic change by inspiring individuals and by inspiring collectives alike, by helping them to see brighter futures. Now, to do that, designers need new skills. We need to learn from or partner with the artists, the writers, the critics, the technologists already in this kind of space. We will need to improve our knowledge of, maybe we'll call them the, the narrative arts, of writing, storytelling, filmmaking. We'll need to better understand the worlds of futuring and foresight. We need to increase our political and ethical literacy and dive ever deeper into that complex world of systems thinking. But I think our mindsets have to change along with that. Particularly, I think we have to learn to replace the crutch of empathy with genuine inclusivity. It's not going to work if we just imagine from afar what it might be like to live in a developing nation that's at risk uh, most from climate change. We should instead involve those communities, empower them to create their own positive visions and solutions decolonizing our design practices, dropping this pretense that we can just step into someone else's shoes. I think we also need to develop, to build some understanding, some intuition for where we may be headed toward harm, where our old patterns of design may be undermining our best efforts at reform. So if I may, I'll offer a few thoughts on that myself. If your work is predicated upon endless growth, if you haven't stopped to consider the potential harm your work, your work might be doing, if you're focused entirely on shareholder value, if you treat people as means and not ends, if you spend weeks on onboarding for your product and don't give a fig about the end of life, if you try to increase inessential consumption or productivity or prosperity just for individuals and not considering wider, wider social well-being, if you focus just on the best case and not every case, if you rely upon complex physical supply chains stretching the globe, and of course, if your work doesn't make you proud, then you might just be contributing to climate crisis and likely other injustices as well. Now, many of these are political points, and it's become a, a modern cliche to say that design is and always has been political. But it's true. It may be that it's appeared not to be over the last couple of decades, but that's only because it's aligned invisibly with the default politics of the time. This supposedly non-political design that we've practiced all this time is the same design that's now taking us toward climate dystopia. And similarly, design has always been ethical. Because when you design, you're making a claim about what should be what should happen next, about how we should live in years to come. And simultaneously, we're discarding, we're throwing away thousands of alternative futures. So ethics and politics have always weaved their way through our work and through each other. Politics essentially acts as a moral multiplier. So this ethically and politically loaded work, that's going to be a challenge to quite a lot of people. It will upset and scare people, particularly our corporate peers, the very people who we've tried to impress, who've learned to trust design as essentially a competitive advantage all this time. They will tell us that speculative and critical design are incompatible with the way that we want to run our businesses. And of course, yeah, I mean, that, that's the whole point of it. Tech companies have tried for decades now, to cling to some semblance of neutrality on critical issues. 
so scared of alienating half their user base or of upsetting regulators or politicians. But I think the present crisis shows that that simply is no longer sustainable. If in doubt, your loyalty now has to be to the world and not to your employer. Speaking personally, I don't want a seat at the table. I want to flip that table. Now, of course, I say that from a position of significant privilege. As an independent and senior member of the industry, I don't answer to anyone. I have the luxury to be able to make bold statements like that while you know, stood on a stage. Not everyone else has those advantages, and I would never criticize anyone who doesn't feel able to take that stronger stand. But I will say this. If you feel safe and comfortable and respected within your job, within your industry, within your career, then you are in the perfect position to use up just a bit of that goodwill to push for the change that we urgently need. Because we shouldn't be dissuaded from the magnitude of that fight. Our peers in technology will tend to fall back on technological solutions to climate. We can expect to see a lot more progress in geoengineering, people trying to spray aerosols in the air to reflect the sun's rays, or carbon capture schemes, things like that. And these may well help. They may well be part of the solution. But any new technology will come with its own set of unintended consequences, which may be just as bad. So they can't be the only solutions. The future needs people like us, people who excel at behavior, at systems thinking, at analyzing problems to really identify and to address the root causes. I think these speculative and critical and future-leaning approaches will help us to make valuable contributions. I'd say design's most important role today is to help us survive the century. Given the magnitude of the challenge ahead of us, I don't think that's a melodramatic statement. Now, hopefully, we can address that, as I say, with more sustainable products, but also these new modes of design that help people imagine and to feel, to experience a better world to come that mobilize people for individual and collective and systemic change. And we've got to do it quickly. Alex Stefan, who's a climate campaigner, has this fantastic but also slightly horrifying quote. When it comes to climate, winning slowly is the same as losing. And we shouldn't be under any illusions. There is still a real chance that we will lose this fight. Maybe our weak ideologies are too strongly held. Maybe the change that's so necessary lies just beyond our grasp. But even if that's how it ends up, even if those few shards of hope that we have prove too insubstantial, we still must try. And I find some sad and proud comfort in the words of Kelly Hayes. If the end really is only a few decades away and no human intervention can stop it, then who do you want to be at the end of the world? And what will you say to the people you love when time runs out? If it comes to that, I plan on being able to tell them I did everything I could. Thank you.